This is a pretty big claw. I mean, you know, a bear would be happy to have a claw. Coming up so. on Meet the Author, Dino Geek Dr. Thomas Holtz digs local outcrops. A visit to the Smithsonian's type room. And your questions. How come Dr. Holtz didn't write an A to Z book about dinosaurs? But first, an update on working writers. At this year's National Book Festival in Washington, D.C., Tiki Barber, author. former running back for the New York Here's Giants, says writing plans One, and game plans are pretty much the same. Tiki's take on the power of reading and writing? Find a passion and find a passion in reading. And then once you do, you're going to expose yourself to so many different avenues and interests and variety of dreams. And then set goals for yourself. Write them down, stick them on your bed, look at it every night, and then ask yourself, what did I do to reach my goal today? Now stay tuned. Big Dinos for Big Kids is next on what Meet the Author. Technically, Chunkosaurus. Okay, that's not really a technical word. The following program is a production of the Fairfax Network, Fairfax County Public Schools. Funded in part by the Virginia Satellite Educational Network. I'm so glad you're here. We're going to focus on one big book today, but it's really big, an encyclopedia. It's called Dinosaurs, the most complete, up-to-date encyclopedia for dinosaur lovers of all ages by Dr. Thomas R. Holtz. Now, have you heard the term lifelong interest? Long before Dr. Holtz became a scientist, professor, and author, he was just a kid in elementary school. Here's a picture. Check out the lunchbox. Oh yes, and check out his toys. Back in the day, dinosaurs came in two colors, blue and green. But research and books have changed this perception, thanks in part to the work of Dr. Holtz. Dr. Holtz, welcome to the program where kids really can meet the author. Thanks. It's great to have you. At the top of the program, Leanna asked, why didn't Dr. Holtz write an A to Z book? Kids like to read them, kids like to write them. Sure, well, uh, there are a couple reasons I didn't write uh, an A to Z book. Uh, the main one is there's a lot of really good ones out there already who are written by some of my, uh, my colleagues, the other scientists out there. Uh, so I don't think one more would have been that useful. Um, but also, more importantly for me, uh, I thought there's a different way to organize the book. After all, in an A to Z book, if you were to have Allosaurus in it and Yang Chuanosaurus, Allosaurus is going to be at the A's at the beginning of the book. Yang Chuanosaurus with the Y's at the very end of the book. Um, but those dinosaurs are really similar to each other. And I thought it would be better to have them in the same part of the book so that you could understand how this particular group of dinosaurs, the allosaurs, lived, mm -hmm. how they acted, what made them unique, mm -hmm. uh, where they lived in the world, and so forth. So it makes it a lot easier for us to compare the similarities and differences, which is something we work on a lot as we, as we learn. Let's go to some other questions via video. Mm -hmm. uh, these students are from Kent Gardens Elementary, your alma mater. That's right. And they are asking... Dr. Holtz, how many dinosaurs are in the book? Are some of the pictures of the dinosaurs computer generated or did somebody draw it? Did you know how to spell all of the dinosaurs' names? Did you look them up in a book or did you spell track? Let's start with, did you use spell check? Well, I did use spell check, but spell check was only really good for the ordinary English words. Uh, I'm afraid most computers don't know the names of most types of dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but for the ordinary English words, I definitely needed to do that. It's something everyone, ha everyone should do when you're trying to write something for other people to read. And dinosaurs has such strange names, which was a chapter in your book. Exactly. <laughs> One youngster asked, how many dinosaurs are listed in the book? Do you have a number? Uh, we have. I have over 800 dinosaurs listed in the book. Um, all of them are listed at a, a table at the end of the book. Um, and what I list in that table are the genera. Um, a genus, the plural of, of genus is genera. A genus is a one word dinosaur name like mm -hmm. Allosaurus or Apatosaurus or Tyrannosaurus. Um, so I list all the genera that have been named at the time I wrote the book. But actually, over a hundred new dinosaur genera have been named since I actually wrote the book. And if you go to the website, 
that's listed in the book mm -hmm. and, the, and the appendix at the back, you can go and see all those new dinosaur names. And I'm going to try to keep on updating that when new dinosaur names are, are created. A hundred more. That's quite a, quite a significant number. It is. Another student asked about Luis Ray's dino artwork. And we have a few props in the studio around us, mm -hmm. as you can see, to give viewers a sense of what the illustrations are like in your book. Was the artwork computer generated or hand drawn and colored? Um, Louis actually works with both techniques. Mm -hmm. um, he does a lot of hand drawing uh, for all the little fine details and, and hand coloring, but he'll take those images and he'll scan them into a computer uh, and he'll, he'll change the color slightly in there. And also, in some of the pictures, you'll notice the backgrounds mm -hmm. look really realistic. And that's because they're actually photographs. And what he's done is he's taken the dinosaur and put them in modern environments that he has photographs mm -hmm. of. And from what I understand, Louis Ray also shared a love of dinosaurs when he was a little boy as well. Exactly. Is Ever since correct? he was a little kid, he loved dinosaurs too. And so I was, it was great to work on a project where you know, both I, the writer, mm -hmm. and the artist were, were total dinosaur geeks. Mm -hmm. Passionate. In fact, we're looking at a picture of him now. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's right. That's yep. great. Um, another question that was posed to you earlier are, was, are dinosaur fossils hard to find? And uh, at this point, I would love to, for you to have an opportunity to start sharing some of these really interesting things that you brought along today. Sure. Um, well, dinosaur fossils uh, are somewhat hard to find. Uh, the first thing you have to do is you have to find rocks of the right age because fossils are bits and pieces of living things we find in rocks. And that looks like a plain rock to me. And it, it does, and that's another tricky thing here. So we have to find rocks from the right place and the right time. Mm -hmm. um, so we need rocks that were from the age of dinosaurs. Um, but then on top of that, you have to make sure that what you're looking at isn't just a rock, but was once, in this case, a piece of bone. So this is a piece of dinosaur bone. Um, and the reason I'm able to recognize it is I've got a trained eye and I know what the bones of animals look like. Um, which is why uh, paleontologists, people who study dinosaurs mm -hmm. and other fossil animals, um, have to know both geology, the study of rocks, so we know what rocks look like, and zoology, the study of animals, mm -hmm. so we know what animals look like, and then we could see what they are. But this is just a little chunk of dinosaur bone. It, it doesn't tell us too much about it, but sometimes there are fossils that tell us a lot more. I mean, we can have things like um, the teeth of dinosaurs. This is a, a duplicate, actually, of a dinosaur tooth, in fact, a, a Tyrannosaurus tooth. It's very large. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and then what is this back here? Yeah, and then sometimes we find bits and pieces that weren't actually the hard parts of the animal, the teeth or the bones, but the soft tissues. And this piece right here is dinosaur skin, or rather, it's a copy of the impression May of I, dinosaur skin. May I touch it? Please, okay. go ahead. It's very bumpy. Very bumpy, yeah. sort of like the legs of an alligator or the legs of a yeah. turtle. Some of the bumps are smaller in some places than others too. Right, and what these are, the bumps here are the scales. So dinosaurs, many dinosaurs at least, had scaly skin like lizards mm -hmm. and, and crocodiles and so forth. And this particular dinosaur, a duckbill, it had died and its body was lying on mud. That mud hardened into stone, but that stone kept the impression of the skin, so the shape of the skin. And then paleontologists were able to go and find that skin put plaster on top of it, the plaster hardened, and when you take it off, you get a duplicate of what the actual texture mm -hmm. of the skin was like. That is fascinating. We are speaking with Dr. Thomas R. Holtz, teacher, scientist, and author today. On a recent field trip with our MTA crew, Dr. Holtz illustrates the difference between fossils, sediment, and a sedimentary rock record. It sounds like rocks talk. Let's take a look. More years than you can count, whales, sharks, and giant squid swam along these shores, not far from Gilligan's Pier and the Chesapeake Bay. The coastal waters of Virginia and Maryland share the Chesapeake, but it hasn't always been this way. Since the age of dinosaurs, sea levels, land, and climate have evolved. These changes and the animals who lived here can be found in fossils. So what is a fossil? A fossil is any bit of an ancient organism or a trace of its behavior that's preserved in the sediments. Sediments are bits and pieces of previously existing rocks um, that were broken down by wind and rain 
and gravity and transported from up in the mountains down to the lowlands and eventually to the sea. One of the lessons we learn from geology, from the study of rocks, is that what the conditions are now are not what the way conditions have always been. The stuff down here is from about 45 million years ago. That's 20 million years after the last of the big dinosaurs went extinct. And the rocks further up at the top of this cliff, which I can't climb to because that would be unsafe, um, are, are younger still. They're about 12 million years old. It would be really cool if there was a big dinosaur skeleton here, but there's not going to be. This is, this is too young for a big dinosaur skeleton, and it's the wrong environment. But there's a good chance that there are some fossils in here, and you know I would bet you that there are lots and lots and lots of microfossils, fossils of plankton that are so small you need a microscope to see them. So, um, so the stuff here, the sediments here, um, came from uphill from us, from ultimately back at the Appalachian Mountains out in Western Maryland, West Virginia, Western Virginia, um, and got transported down to the coast. It actually got transported offshore because this sediment, when it was just mud, when it was just mud and sand, settled out at a time when sea level was a lot higher than today. Oh, here's something. It's bone. Okay, but it's recent bone. It's the skull of a fish, a uh, modern fish, not a, not a fossil fish. But this could potentially become a fossil. Um, it's not a fossil now. It's not buried. To make a fossil, you need to bury something. So I'm actually going to help this along. Um, and I'm going to go put it in a place where it can get buried. And that's out here. So maybe, maybe, no, no guarantee, but maybe it's going to get buried by the sand accumulating. And maybe that sediment will eventually become sedimentary rock. And if so, and that's, that skull is still in the rock, it'll be a fossil. It'll be part of a once living thing that's now part of the sedimentary rock record. That was a cool fact, and the trip to the Chesapeake looked like it was pretty neat, too. I wish I could have joined you. Oh, it was quite fun. <laughs> well, you know, we know the climate in the Earth's formation has changed dramatically over the course of so many years. Mm -hmm. But if we were really lucky, do you think uh, we could find evidence of, of uh, ancient dinosaurs and, and huge sharks and ancient whales and all of that on the Chesapeake shoreline? Well, on the Chesapeake shoreline, the rocks are too young to mm -hmm. find dinosaurs, mm -hmm. but they're a great place to find the fossils of giant sharks, and of early whales. Um, some of the shark teeth found out there are from a super giant shark called a megalodon that was about 45 feet long. That's, that's much longer than today's great white shark, one of the most fearsome animals that ever swam the seas. We also find bones out there of, of whales, uh, both baleen, that is plankton-eating whales, mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, sperm whales. And not just the grown-ups. I mean, you can find the big vertebra, that is the backbones, of adults, but you can find the bones of baby whales. And it turns out this was an area that whales went to back uh, about 12 million years ago or so uh, to have babies. Um, so sometimes we could find some really nice fossils like that for dinosaurs, that is where dinosaurs had babies. Could we, oh, before we go to that, sure. is that uh, an example of one of the bones you're talking about? All right, this bone here is actually um, a, a cast, that is uh, a plastic duplicate of a bone of a big meat-eating dinosaur called Acrocanthosaurus. Um, so this shows you the sort of information we can look at from a fossil. We could see the, where the muscles attach. Um, we can recognize what bone it is. In fact, this is the bone right here. It's the upper arm bone, or the humerus, mm -hmm. of the right arm of Acrocanthosaurus. And from this, we can make lots of uh, lots of interpretations about how this animal worked. For example, we can see how strong its muscles were, um, maybe figure out how it used it to capture its prey and so forth. So when we find complete bones, we can learn a lot more than we can with just little chunks like this. All right, and uh, we're gonna stop there and then sure. we're gonna go to that fascinating box. We have a phone call. Tell us your name and what is your question today for Thomas? Um, my name's Alexander. Hi, Alexander. Kent Garden. Okay. And my question is, what is your favorite dinosaur? Ah, uh, well, that, that is an excellent question, and I have an absolutely perfect answer for that, is Tyrannosaurus rex. 
I have loved Tyrannosaurus Rex since I was very, 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 very young. In fact, when I was really young, my parents told me that I told them when I grew up, I was going to become Tyrannosaurus Rex. Well, you loved him. <laughs> I, I really loved him. Now, they said that wasn't going to be possible, unfortunately. So I decided instead that I would study him. And in fact, I have actually made my life's career studying T. rex, that's the, that's the short name for Tyrannosaurus rex, and its closest relatives. And it's a, a group of animals that I, I really love to study. All right, thanks for calling, Alexander. All right, and we were talking about baby dinosaurs that's at the right. Chesapeake shoreline. Right, so mm -hmm. at the Chesapeake we find baby whale bones, um, but we find, and that's because it's an area mm -hmm. that they were raising uh, their babies, we do find places in the world where dinosaurs were raising their babies. Uh, one such place is in South America, in the country of Argentina, and I have a fossil here from that. Uh, this little chunk here is actually part of an eggshell, but not a chicken eggshell. You'll see that it's a lot thicker, you know, almost as thick as... Yeah, it's very thick. If, if this was a, a complete pencil eraser, it's about as thick as an eraser, for because for, all students, are, they know how long that eraser is when they have a brand new pencil in their hands. Right, and the, the whole egg this egg would have been shaped, it was a sphere, it would have been perfectly circular, about the size of a soccer ball. So if you picture the baby that hatched out of that, it was a little animal, an animal, oh I don't know, about the size of a small dog. Um, but that's only when it's a baby. Dinosaurs had a lot of growing up to do because this baby that fits inside a soccer ball sized egg grew up to be bigger than two or three elephants. Wow. And in fact, even the biggest dinosaurs, dinosaurs that were the size of a, size of a herd of elephants, um, grew out of eggs no bigger than this, no bigger than a soccer ball. Do we know how fast they grew from such a, a, a soccer ball to a, such a large animal? Uh, when I was a kid, we didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And that's actually one of the most important dinosaur discoveries made in the last five to 10 years. We now know, and it's incredibly fast. Uh, the, even the biggest dinosaurs took only two or uh, maybe one or two decades, 10 to 20 years to grow That's that big. fast. Well, we have time for an email now. This is Great. from Lauren in Miss Hanfee's class at Kent Gardens. And Lauren would like to know, was it hard to make up funny titles like growing up with the tyrant lizard? Um, I liked uh, big brains, fast feet. <laughs> how, how, what about writing these subtitles? Tell us more about that. Sure, um, yeah, it, it was, Actually, it was kind of hard to come up with a funny name for all these sections. I, I tried to have something in each section that was, that was sort of humorous to keep people's interests going and so forth. Uh, sometimes it was easier than others, uh, but, uh, but sometimes I really had to sit there and think. And actually, this is where um, when you write books, you don't write them just yourself. I mean, I write the text myself, but I have help from an editor. An editor is a person from a company that looks at the text and says, you want to change something here or maybe correct this here? And my editor, Alice, she would give me really good ideas of, maybe you want to talk about, about speed. I said, oh, okay, you know, big brains, fast feet. Very good. Well, let's take a few more questions via video. Again, these students are from Kent Garden Elementary. Let's take a look. What inspired you to write the book? Why did you write such a detailed book? Out of all the dinosaurs, which one is your favorite? I want to be a paleontologist when you grow up. What advice would you give me? Okay, a lot of good questions again. Let's yeah. pick up on the what inspired you to write such a detailed book. Well, um, there's a lot of books with simple information for young people about dinosaurs, and I thought that you could build on that, that young people can understand a lot of stuff about science as long as you give them the background. So I had to set up the background information, and from that, you could learn a lot more about how dinosaurs lived. And so that, that's the, my inspiration for writing a detailed book. Okay. And one of the kids asked about being a paleontologist. What would you tell him? Well, to be a paleontologist, you really have to be interested in nature. And you have to go out there. You have to like to look at, at natural things. And you also have to study. You have to study science. You've got to study math. And really, and this, this applies to not just paleontology, not just science, you've got to read. If you want to go on to be a professional, like a scientist, like a paleontologist, you got to love reading all sorts of books. One of the things I really liked about the book, besides all that detailed information, is the number of uh, scientists that you invited to provide short essays about their research. Why did you choose to invite them to participate in your book? Well, I invited my colleagues to submit little things in there, to, to write little essays. 
Um, because no one person could know everything about any subject, even dinosaurs. So, um, so each of them brought their own perspective and their own insight into it because they each have their own specialization. And also, uh, they might disagree with me, and that's fine, because we try to interpret the evidence, and it's important for people to know we don't always come to the same conclusions. <laughs> and we'll be hearing from one of those scientists in a few minutes, a little bit later in the show. Your book isn't just about dinosaurs. It's about the connection between imagination and scholarship. We're going to highlight two nuggets from today's featured book, artist Luis Ray and museum curator Matthew Carano. And when we return, more of your questions. Artists such as Louis Ray are using their imagination regarding the color and texture of ancient creatures. But Louis Ray is also relying on recent scientific discoveries to make his drawings as accurate as possible. As scientists, paleontologists make predictions to help students and artists think about what dinosaurs ate, if they traveled in packs, or if they sang like birds. Dr. Carano, for example, in addition to his work as a museum curator, tells us that he's trying to determine how fast dinosaurs moved based on the evidence of bones. I look at the shapes of the joints, which tell me a little bit about motion. This is the knee here. And I look at all these very interesting little processes, and you can see this little patch here, all the spots where the muscles were attached. So even though we don't have the muscles preserved, we can see the places on the bone where they were. And by studying these in different dinosaurs and in animals that are alive today, I can understand how the muscles and the bones work together, and I can make predictions about how this dinosaur might have worked. One thing, for example, is there's a muscle here, very close to the top end of the bone, and one thing I can do is I can take measurements on that using this, which uh, called a caliper, and this, as you can see, I can adjust, and I can measure just how far that muscle is from the hip. That's what the top of the bone is. I can take these measurements in a whole variety of animals, and one of the things I learned is that in animals that are particularly speedy, this muscle is very close to the hip. And in animals that are much slower, the muscle is very far down. So this tells me that an animal like Mexicosaurus was probably a fairly quick animal. The job of a museum curator is to conduct research and take care of its collection. Here's a sneak peek of a few items the public rarely gets to see. So here you can see uh, fossils that are being worked on by uh, other members of the curatorial staff. This is a very nice skeleton of uh, an ancient seal called Inaliarctos. You can see the head of it right at this end. It's a complete skeleton. Uh, now let me show you one of the more unusual items in our collection. So as you can see, a lot of the stuff in these collections has been here for a long time, up to 100 years, or 150 in some cases. Uh, but over here, what I'd like to show you, some of our more unusual fossils. Uh, this is dung, uh, the droppings of a prehistoric ground sloth. You can see um, they still contain the grass and the other plants that were the last meal. So this is a great opportunity to study the actual diet of this animal. We're in what's called the type room. Uh, this is actually scientifically the most important room in our collection because it includes all the type specimens. Uh, when scientists discover a new species, they have to pick one specimen that will be the reference of that species forever. Here, for example, we have actually this is the head of Stegosaurus, and the Smithsonian has the type specimen of what's called Stegosaurus stenops. Um, and here is a complete skull of that animal, and you can actually see underneath the skull all the very small teeth. This was a plant-eating dinosaur, and also the very small area where the brain would have been, so not a particularly bright dinosaur either. Um, this specimen was found in the 1880s, and so it's been here in the museum for over 125 years. So one of the things we have to do here is we actually have to continually conserve the fossils that are already in our collections. And here you can see examples of the techniques we use to do that. Each of these is called a clamshell, and the clamshell is made of plaster with bo uh, metal bars for support, and inside you can just see this very thin layer of foam, and that layer of foam protects the fossil inside. We make a separate one, especially for each fossil. And this will be a stable storage for at least another 50 to 100 years. If you look a little bit farther, 
you can see why we have to do this. These are examples of specimens that were collected almost 100 years ago, and they were just stored by resting them on these plaster surfaces. And as you can see, the bones have not done very well. We actually can't remove them without special preparation. So we're going to gradually conserve these and store them in our new techniques. So this is one of my favorite specimens in the collection. It's a triceratops, and it's part of the head of this animal. And I like it because it shows a lot of different things. Uh, one of the things it shows is how you can tell apart a fossil, which is this dark brown material, from the rock it's in, which is this light brown sediment. It also shows you how a very incomplete specimen can be important for scientists. There's almost nothing of this animal except the back of the head, but here, one researcher has sawed the animal's skull in half, and in outlined in white, you can see the brain cavity of this Triceratops. Triceratops had sinuses in its forehead, just like you and I. Uh, but we would never have known that had we not looked inside this, uh, what otherwise is a bit of a beat up specimen. As curator of Dinosauria, Matthew Carano is responsible for millions of specimens. And though he conducts his own research, he knows the museum collection is a small window into the past, as well as to the future. For more information about the dinosaur collection at the Smithsonian, visit their website. I can tell you as a teacher that Smithsonian website for kids really is a terrific resource. Mm. We have a call. This uh, call is from Michelle from Annandale Terrace. Hi, Michelle. What is your question today? Uh, um, when did the dinosaur go to the Chesapeake Bay? When did the dinosaurs go to the Chesapeake Bay? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, dinosaurs lived in this part of the country throughout most of their history. So they were here from about 230 million years ago to 65 million years ago when the great dinosaurs disappeared. It's a long time ago. Thanks for calling. Before we go, can you share with us a, a tip for writing nonfiction? And I'd also be interested in hearing from you the weirdest, wackiest, mm. wildest facts you might have about dinosaurs. Sure. Um, in terms of writing nonfiction, uh, the most important thing is getting your facts straight and getting your facts to the audience. Sometimes that might mean keeping it really simple and keeping it really brief. And sometimes it might mean telling it in a funny way that the audience or the reader is going to remember. Um, so as long as you get the points across, that's the most important thing. Now, as for the weirdest thing about dinosaurs, uh, in the last 10 years, really, we've come to understand that many of the dinosaurs we already knew about, things like Velociraptor and Oviraptor and so forth, actually had feathers on their body. And that's very different from the way we normally picture dinosaurs back in the old days. But, but now we've got the evidence. We've seen the feathers in the fossils. So, so much as strange as it might seem, Velociraptor, Deinonychus, Oviraptor actually were feathered animals. A weird new fact for me. Thank yep. you, Dr. Holtz. Thank you so much for joining us today and talking dinosaurs. Oh, thanks. I was glad to be here. Thank you. If you would like to learn more about children's books written by Dr. Thomas R. Holtz, visit his webpage at randomhouse.com. If you would like more information about this program, visit us at the Fairfax Network. And from all the crew, we send our best wishes to our good friend, Jigsaw Bob. Get well soon. For the Fairfax Network, I'm Della Kidd. Keep reading, keep writing, and keep dreaming.